Good morning, everyone. So I just wanted to take some time to welcome you all before we kick this off with our keynote. Uh, this year, our slogan is breaking boundaries bite by bite. So as you enjoy the event, please keep in mind the different ways that representation in cybersecurity, whether it's gender, sexuality, skill level, red, blue, or purple team affiliation can help protect data today and in the future. We're really sad that this is online and we're not all in Vegas. On the other hand, none of us had to actually pay all that money for the hotel and flights. So I guess there is a silver lining. We found Hopin and we are hoping that this enables us to have a friendly and calm environment where we can still have those hallway conversations and random meetups. Throughout the event, you can click on the networking tab to get randomly paired with other people. And if there's no one there, it will just sit there. So don't be worried. You can always come back in later. And also, anyone can create a session. So if you decide you want to have a group talking about DFIR, feel free to go in and create a session and have your own little unconference session. We also have an information booth. If you have questions, go ahead, click on sessions, and head over into the information booth, and they will try to find you the answer. If you have any safety concerns during the event at all, click on sessions, or sorry, click on reception, click on the safety operations link, and you can report an issue and they'll address it. We hope that there are none, but it is there if you need it. We also have a career village again this year. We've got mock interviews, resume reviews, and even a raffle for online learning courses sponsored by eLearn Security. For anyone that's interested, we also have a capture the flag competition going throughout the event. There's a workshop immediately following the keynote over in the villages stage. So if you've never participated before, or if you've participated, but you feel a little nervous, go ahead, show up to the workshop and they will get you kickstarted. We wanna do a huge thank you to all of our sponsors. Without them, we could not have afforded to do this event. MongoDB, Microsoft, Salesforce, Verizon, Amazon Information Security, eLearn Security, Remediant, Intel, Thermo Fisher Scientific, Coinbase, and NS8. They're all in the expo hall. Speaking of the expo hall, there's a whole bunch of community organizations, events, and there's even Red Team Village with a series of talks going on throughout the day in the expo hall. We've got some prizes to give away in there too, so you might as well stop in. Finally, I just wanted to say we're really grateful that you've all taken time out of your day to come by, and we hope that you have a great event. Jasmine, take it from here. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I am Jasmine, and welcome to our keynote, um, which is uh, with Tracy Z. Mayleaf. Um, just as a quick reminder, uh, there is a pinned post in the, in the chat for this stage for a keynote-specific raffle. Uh, there's a Google Docs form to click and enter. Um, Tracy is uh, talking about empathy as a service to create a culture of security. Um, she is an information security analyst at the New York Times Company with a background in uh, library science. And I will go ahead and hand it over. Thank you, Jasmine. Hello, everyone. OK. Ja uh Hopefully you can see my, yep, there we go, okay. All right, thank you all for joining me today. Your participation in this Diana Initiative event means that you support women and non-binary folks in information security, and that's a great thing. Diversity of thought solves problems. Events like this couldn't happen without the support of allies, so welcome to everyone today. I'd also like to recognize that being here today means that you have an interest in your personal and professional development, and that deserves praise. For some of you, this event may be outside your comfort zone and you are to be commended for taking the step to be here. So welcome to everyone. Let's begin my talk today about the concept of empathy as a service to create a culture of security. But first, <laughs> have a disclaimer. First a disclaimer and then an end such. Disclaimer is, thoughts and opinions expressed are mine and my own and not that of my employer. In other words, if you take issue with something that I say, please take it up with me. 
If we were in person, I would encourage that you buy me a gin and tonic at the bar afterwards. Uh, but for now, just send me a note if you have something that you disagree with and I'll be happy to discuss it with you. And then my end such is, uh, what I'm about to present to you is a structure of thought from library science. I will show you how it can be transferred into information security. I know that to some of you that seems like a far-fetched idea. The things that I cover in my talk may not apply to everyone, but I just ask that you listen with an open mind and apply what you can to your situation. Thank you. Let's begin. There are people who believe that I have no business being in an information security job. Why is that? Because on paper, I am a woman of a certain age with a liberal arts and library science education and no real tech experience. That's how I look on paper. But if you look deeper, you'd understand how I bring with me transferable skills and a different point of view very much needed in this field. But on paper, I look like what someone once said to me at DEF CON, that I look like I was searching for the Tupperware convention and got lost. Yeah, that really happened. But this talk isn't about me. It's about my wish for the information security industry and community to utilize empathy more often when dealing with end users, colleagues, and anyone else you deal with professionally when it involves security. Considering how someone looks on paper is a very short-sighted view of how they really are. Using the seven-step principle from library science called the reference interview, I'm going to show you how to be more considerate and conscious of people and how these steps can, tur can turn them into security advocates. Look beyond the superficial. People are not paper. Before we go any further, I'd like to quickly clarify the definition of empathy. Empathy is not sympathy. I'm not asking you to feel sorry for your end users. I'm asking that you imagine what it must be like in their shoes, how security looks from their perspective. For many people, the idea of a password manager or identifying a phishing email is a scary thing. This does not make them stupid. Therefore, do not belittle them over their lack of knowledge. Theodore Roosevelt said, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. It doesn't matter if you are the leadest of all the elite hackers in the land. If you don't demonstrate some empathy and compassion while dealing with people, that knowledge means nothing. In other words, don't put people down for not being tech or security savvy just to make yourself feel more important. That is a garbage attitude to have, and you're better than that. So what are the steps of the reference interview? You can see them here on the screen. I will go through each one and explain how it relates to security and how you can implement it in your own world. Remember, when I'm talking about empathy as a service, I mean this not just for end users, but for your colleagues, whether that means other departments within your company or other professionals outside your company. It's also just great to use empathy as a service for these newcomers to the industry who wanna learn. This is a great guideline of how to troubleshoot the core of security, humans. So, you know, there's one thing that brings all these steps together. There, we have approachability, interest, listening, interviewing, searching, answering, follow-up. What's the one thing that brings them all together? No gatekeeping. Empathy as a service is a no gatekeeping zone. That's another garbage attitude that needs to go away. Let's get started on these reference interview steps, starting with approachability. One of the things that made a strong impression on me when I first started in information security was the collective disdain and contempt for end users that I heard from many in the industry and the community. Whether you wanna believe it or not, many parts of security are essentially customer service jobs. Now, I don't mean that as a derogatory statement, it's the truth. Security is human-centric. Humans are the asset that we need to protect. So approachability, one of the factors of it is reputation. How do your end users and fellow professionals view you? Are you the angry security person? 
Are you the helpful person that people feel comfortable reaching out to? Now, this just isn't limited to individuals. How is your security team regarded within your organization? Do they think you are the scary trolls who boom, none shall pass? If you're unsure how your security team is regarded, you may want to ask around or even have a survey. I know that sounds basic, but if you really cannot gauge how the security team is regarded, you need to find out. If the results are unfavorable, well then, you need to start there. You need to start repairing a bad reputation. One way to, to repair that reputation and to judge your approachability is your contactability. Do your end users easily know how to contact you? What do your outgoing voicemail and email messages say to them? What's the tone of voice in your, in your speech or in your writing? Does your security area have a phone number, a Slack channel, messaging apps? How can people contact you? When I first started at my SOC job, there was a woman who was surprised to learn that there were actually humans in security. And I was confused and I asked her what she meant. And she said, oh, I thought everything was just automated by computers. I didn't think there was actually humans working there. And I, I turned to my boss and I said, don't you ever do outreach to the, the end users? And I just kind of got a shrug. Know that there's people on the other end in security and know, make sure that they know how to, that your users know how to contact you. You were all humans, make sure that they know how to be contacted. And another part of, of being contacted is communication. This may not apply to everyone, but I worked for a multinational global company for this in the SOC, and we had users who did not speak English as their primary language. If you have users in your organization who may not be strong in English, do you have accommodations for them? So an example of this is we would receive emails in another language, which I would translate, and I would respond to them using the translator which my coworkers got mad about because one said to me, now they're gonna expect all of us to do that. Well, we should, it's our job to get back to them. Have you noticed that maybe the phishing fails in your company in the South American offices are higher than other regions? Do you have educational materials in Spanish and Portuguese for them? Or are you expecting them to learn about security by reading another language? I have a couple of these story time slides in here. So let me tell you my first story. So that says in English, that says, uh, don't speak English. It's Italian for don't speak English. So story time. It was late in the day. I was about ready to go home, working in the SOC. An alert went off that there was some malicious documents being downloaded. Did my investigation and realized that it was a laptop in one of the offices in Italy. And given the time difference, I realized it was about midnight or one in the morning. So immediately I'm thinking, oh, this is not good. What is going on here? I was able to quickly deduce that it was a security guard. So probably an overnight security guard was bored, probably downloading things. So through the messaging app that we had at the company, I was able to see that he was online. So in English, just not really thinking, I sent a message. And I could see the read receipt. And then, but nothing, there was silence. And I'm getting more and more concerned about whatever's being downloaded. And I'm you know, thinking all the worst thoughts. And then it occurred to me, this person might not speak English. So went to an online translator, the, figured out what I wanted to say, put it in the chat box. The very first sentence I used was, I am using an online translator. Please excuse any grammatical errors. I recommend this whenever you're using an online translator to communicate because we know that they're not 100% accurate. And rather than someone getting this disjointed message that seems strange, just give them the courtesy of a warning. Hey, I don't speak your language. I'm using this tool to help me. So just keep that in mind. After I posted what I wanted to say in Italian, he wrote back immediately in Italian. Bingo, I hit on it. Then I translated what he said. And then through that exchange of translating, I was able to get him to stop downloading. I was able to initiate a virus scan of his computer and get him to understand the situation. And that's all it was. He just needed to be told to stop, but in a language that he could understand. So I took an extra step to be heard because it was this person that needed to be protected 
and I was speaking, literally speaking their language. Another way for approachability is feeling seen. Now, this is usually a term used in a negative way. I want you to embrace this as a positive thing. Get out inside your company. You know, what do I mean by this? Network with people internally. I want you to adopt what has been known, call, has been known as an intrapreneurial spirit. That's the essence of an entrepreneur, but with inside your organization. Market your security department. Market yourself. Develop what's called an elevator pitch, anything from one to five sentences about what you do, what the security team does, what the security can, team can do for your end users and other departments. Maybe even talk to your marketing folks on some strategies of how you can better promote what the security team does. This is where metrics come in. Maybe have some metrics that you can, without having any OPSEC issues, <laughs> sharing them to tell people what you do. For a lot of people, the security team's a mystery. So help them understand what you do and what you can do for them. At, at my old company, uh, the marketing team decided to create these coffee mugs that said something along the lines of, by the time you finish drinking this cup of coffee, we will have defended 10,000 cyber incidents or something like that. Now, we had a good laugh about it because we don't know where they got that number from, but I appreciated the sentiment. It was a way to get the information out to the company in a fun way to show what the security team did. The end goal of approachability is that you want people to be thinking of the security team when issues come up. Being approachable will, will help remind them of that. So if that means joining a book club or a softball team or just going to events and introducing yourself, just, hi, I'm Tracy from security that puts a name and a face to security for something that a lot of people thought was just an automated machine, you know, and a blinky block somewhere in a, in a back room. Put a name and a face to security. The next step is interest. Now this one I have a hard time describing because essentially I boil this down to, this is just doing your job. You need to be interested in what people are bringing to you. Be interested in solving the problem at hand. What I like to stress to people is don't play hot potato, if you're familiar with that. You know, someone lands, the pro you know, you have a problem that lands in your situation and you're real quick to get rid of it. You know, not my job, not my department, not my issue. An another way to avoid this is stop doing what I call blind transfers or blind handovers. And let me explain. Have you ever called a customer service line and maybe you didn't reach the right department and they need to transfer you someone else. That's really frustrating, right? Well, what do good places do? Good places will call the correct department, get a new agent on the phone and either have you on the phone while you hear them explain the situation and do the handover or you'll be muted and then they'll, they'll put you over. Don't just throw a problem at someone and don't just get rid of it because that makes the user feel really bad, that you don't care, that you're not interested in solving their security problem. And then they're wondering, why did I even contact security in the first place? You wanna make your interaction with an end user a safe, split, a safe place, meaning don't belittle them, don't mock them, don't be condescending, be interested in the situation at hand. This is also just a good thing to practice with your fellow professionals and your fellow departments. You know, if somebody contacts you and it's really a help desk issue, don't just throw your hands up and say, oh, not my problem, it's the help desk. Explain to the user, oh, you know, you've reached security, but I think you really want the help desk. May I send you over there? Let them know what's going on. Keep them informed, be interested. So here's an example of how you can show interest through written communication. And I cannot stress this enough. If you're using written communication, you are not E.E. E. Cummings. You use sentence case, use punctuation. I wanna give you an example of a letter here that is very brief, but conveys a lot of information that again, shows your interest in the user's problem. So first you need to have a salutation. In this case, we have dear Robert. It could be hi, Susan. It could be hello, Rajiv. However you wanna do a salutation. Let's look at the body of the message. I have two sentences that convey four very important pieces of information. Let's look at the first sentence. Thank you for contacting the security team about the phishing email you received. Two pieces of information. You thank them 
and you tell the, you re, you reiterate what they contacted you about. Why do you thank the end user? Because they didn't have to contact you. They didn't have to go out of their way to send you a phishing email or another problem that you're dealing with. So you thank them for contacting you. And then you re reiterate why they contacted you so that it's not just a generic, hey, thanks for email. Why did you contact them? The phishing email. I'm going to tell you why you contacted me. You contacted me about that phishing email. Second sentence. We will investigate and get back to you within a business day. Two pieces of information. Your action, what you're going to do, investigate, and a reasonable amount of time to get back to them. So again, the, the person receiving this message knows what you're going to do with it and when to expect a time that you'll, they'll hear back from you. So two sentences, four very important inf information that the person knows that you are interested in their problem and they know what's going on. So then you'll want a complimentary close. You can use best regards, sincerely, cheers. And then most of us have signature files in our email, but make sure that when you sign off on it, put your name, put your title. Again, you wanna make sure that people know there's a human behind this email. Who are you? And you know what's your responsibility? Are you a manager? Are you an analyst? Give people context. This is a great example of showing interest in the user and having really clear, concise, professional communication. So I want to share another story with you. So I received a call one day in the SOC, and I could tell immediately that this, this gentleman, Carl, was sick. I could hear he was congested. I could hear the wheezing in his voice. But I could also hear the tension and the stress. And he said to me, I'm homesick. I'm on a lot of cold medicine. And I realized that I just clicked on a malicious email. So I said, okay, now this talk isn't about remediation, so I'm not going to go through what I did, but I you know, was able to get information from him of which email he was referring to, and I investigated. And long story short, it turns out it you know, was a false positive, no harm, no foul. The site that he clicked on was actually taken down. Everything's fine. But the part stuck in my head of, okay, he's kind of drugged up right now, and he made a poor security decision. What can I do to show interest and kind of help on the side of security? So I came up with a little bit of a fib. I said, okay, Carl, we are going to do a virus scan of your laptop. Are you able to spend an hour away from your laptop? Now, you and I know that it doesn't necessarily take an hour to do a virus scan, but again, fibbing for the purpose of security. And he said, yes, I can step away for an hour. I said, okay, let's do this. I'm going to walk you through how to initiate a virus scan on your laptop. Go take a nap. Go take an hour nap. When you feel refreshed, go back on your computer. And he said, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that. And I could, tell, I could hear the tension leave his voice. I could still hear that he was sick, but I could feel the tension go away. So that's how we left things. Now, again, I told a little bit of a fib. But again, I was very quickly thinking, what other bad security decisions is he going to make while he's under the influence of cold medicine? So I just, you know, made a quick decision of, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to fib a little bit and no harm, no foul. He got to take a nap. He understood what he did was wrong. There was no need to beat him up for it. Virus scan came back clean. All is right in the world. So now let's talk about listening. I know it's very uh, easy to want to jump in and you, you already have the person's problem figured out or so you think when they're talking to you. Resist the urge to jump ahead and say, I know what this is. I want you to pay attention to what the end user doesn't say. And this is a little bit tricky, but I want you to think about what they're not telling you and how do you do this? So basically, you know how to do troubleshooting and, re and remediation in your head, right? So think of it as a checklist. And until you get really good at it, you may need to write this down. But say you go through your head of all the ways you would remediate the problem. Is that user saying the information that's ticking the boxes for you to remediate the problem? If they're not, then you go back and you follow up on that. So let me give you an example. Someone will say, I know I'm using a lot of phishing emails as examples, but they're the easiest ones to do. But you're smart enough to correlate this to other issues. So say someone calls you and said, I clicked on a, an email that when I went to the website, it looked really strange, and I closed it, and then I called you. 
okay, great. Thank you for contacting us. In my mind, I think, I want to know what happened between the click and the closing. They didn't say anything. I think most of us would assume that nothing happened, but I go in with a pointed question. Okay, great. So tell me what action did you take before you closed the browser? And this actually happened one time. Someone said to me, oh, well, uh, it asked for my Microsoft 365 login. So I entered the information. And when I hit enter, nothing happened. So then I figured something was wrong. And I closed the browser and I called you. So I think we all can figure out what happened, right? Their password was just stolen. But they didn't say that the first time. Again, not because they were, they're stupid, not because they're dumb. To them, that wasn't a detail that was necessary. That didn't mean anything to them, but that means the world to us, right? So you need to listen to what they don't say. Users may omit information because they don't realize it's relevant, or sometimes they're very nervous when they contact security and they're just not thinking straight. You need to listen for what is not being said. F. Scott Fitzgerald said, to be kind is more important than to be right. Many times what people need is not a brilliant mind that speaks, but a special heart that listens. Don't lecture someone about how they hell, fell for an obvious phishing e email or overlooked what we would consider to be an easy security fix. Don't say I told you so, just listen. The next step is interviewing. One of the best techniques is to, to repeat back what the person just said to you, whether that's an email, in person, or over the phone. That shows the, the listener or the recipient that you're paying attention and that you understand the problem. And remember what I just talked about, about paying attention to what they don't say? I talked about this a little bit already, but I'm gonna to emphasize this. You then need to ask questions, but not in an accusatory manner. What did you do? What did you do is, is very accusatory, right? It sounds like blame. It's very hard to say that without it sounding like blame. So what I recommend is that you try some other phrases. What action did you take? What happened next? What transpired? Remember that meme of Bill Hader eating the popcorn? I want you to be like that. Oh, it's like a mystery. What happened next? What action did you take? Not what did you do? Again, you don't want to have blame. You want them to, you want, it's elicitation. You want to draw as much information out of them. And there's an old expression of you get more flies with honey than vinegar. You want the honey to flow so that the information will flow so that you can solve these problems. And this is whether it's an end user or maybe the, the devs and engineering department. Maybe they're talking about something and they're maybe not sharing all the information because they don't think it's relevant. So just ask some questions in a nice way to let the information flow so that you can work on a security problem together. Searching. Now, this is kind of redundant because a lot of what we do is searching anyway <laughs> to solve problems, but I wanna, I wanna give you some ideas of different ways to, to look at this. One way to look at it is, did a security precaution fail the end user or the other department? Was it really their fault? You know, help the user connect the dots. I can't stress this enough. Don't let security get in the way of people doing their jobs. And one example of this is one time I was in a meeting with another department and they came to security and said, we would like to purchase this new software and we'd like security you know, to give it its blessing. And in hindsight, I think we as security were probably a little too harsh on this other department, really picking apart their software choice and raising issues and things like that. And something that the, the manager of the other department said really just struck me and really just made me pay attention and correct my ways. He said, why do I feel like my department is being punished for coming to security? <gasps> oh, all the things that I hold dear about being a security advocate, that just was a knife through the heart. He was absolutely right. We were making them feel bad. We were giving them an extraordinary tough time when they did the right thing, how many other departments just buy software and don't ever involve security? So how did that procedure fail that department? You know, and that gave us 
that gave us encouragement of how to change the process so that wouldn't happen again. So you need to search for ways to solve problems when you may not have realized that there was a problem. So let's talk about another story. Let's talk about accounts receivable Rhonda. So one day I uh, get an email and Rhonda explains that she's new to, uh, she's not new to the company, but she's new to this position where she now has to pay invoices. And she's been doing it for about, you know, a month or two. And there's this one vendor that they pay weekly that all of a sudden it, the invoice shows up and it's different than before. It used to be just a PDF attachment, but now it's a link to, you know, DocuSign or some, some site like that. And she didn't know what to do. So immediately they gave her pause. So the first thing I did was commend her for contacting security and, you know, asked her questions about it. So I said, let me, let me investigate this DocuSign and I'll get back to you. Cause we know a lot of times phishing emails go through sites like that. So I tore everything apart. I couldn't find anything wrong with this. So I, this time I called Rhonda back and I said, Rhonda, do you have a contact at this company? And she said, yes, Joanne. I said, okay, can you talk to Joanne to see if this is a new method that they're using? And Rhonda's response was, well, yes, I can email her. And this is when I helped Rhonda connect the dots. I said, Rhonda, if this company has been compromised and their email is compromised, there's a chance that if you email Joanne, you might be emailing the, the bad actor. She hadn't thought of that. And she was very apologetic. And I said, don't apologize. It's, it's fine. Security's my job. I'm helping you understand this. So I said, I, I said, do you know what her voice is? Have you talked to her before? She said, yes. I said, great. Call her. Ask her about this. So long story short, they changed the way that they did invoices and bothered to not tell anyone that they were invoicing, that they changed it. So again, Rhonda, if she had not reached out to security, she might have, what, just paid the invoice. And in this case, it was safe. But what if it wasn't? What if months went by and then the vendor said, hey, you haven't paid us for months. And Rhonda's saying, no, I've paid you all this time. But Rhonda also didn't understand about email compromise. Because again, that's not Rhonda's job. I've told this story before and people will push back and say, oh, well, Rhonda should have, should have known why. Security is not Rhonda's job. It's my job. It's my job to help Rhonda connect the dots, which I did. So again, I, I took time to explain to her that situation. And then from that moment on, she knew that whenever something looked different, she would reach out for assistance. And she knew that maybe emailing back wasn't the right way to do that. So you need to kind of search for answers in a different way and help people find those answers. So now let's talk about answering. <laughs> Uh, again, I can't stress this enough. You need to thank people for contacting security and you need to remind them. I've already mentioned this once or twice. You need to remind people that they did a good thing. Even if it's a false alarm, you need to remind them you did a good thing by contacting us because in my mind, I'm looking at the big picture of, okay, well, we safe this time. What if we weren't, you know, this was good that you contacted us. Uh, another th phrase that I like to use is it's a, it's a very American centric thing to say you're welcome. If someone says, thank you. What I prefer to say is my pleasure to help or just my pleasure. Because again, I, I feel like we're not doing them a favor. I feel like if someone says, thank you. And you say, you're welcome. I feel li like it's more like a transactional favor. This is my job. This is my passion. This is what I enjoy. I don't want to say you're welcome. I'm going to say my pleasure. So it's my pleasure to help. And if you don't feel comfortable saying that, then, then think of something else, but just, you know, respond to them in a way that, you know, you want to create that safe space that they feel good that they reached out to you. So when you answer people, I also want to bring up something called a teachable moment. A teachable moment is something that we talk a lot about library science. It's, it's when you take that extra time to kind of show someone the, the way of, you know, of the mistake that they made and show them how to do something right going forward. So this is an example of a teaching material from a, a university in Canada. And I would keep things like this saved on my desktop all the time. And I would use them as, as teachable moments of, you know, hey, let's, let me show you how that really works. So this is a good thing to have. Now, whether it's your regular educational material or something you create yourself, it's also good to keep these in a format 
that you can send to someone, whether it's an internal link or a PDF or something, uh, something that you can send to them. Because most of the time I have found that people are willing to stay on the phone or stay on an email exchange with me to learn this. But sometimes you'll get someone who'll be like, I don't have time for that. I just want to go. So you want to be able to send it to them too. So have things saved on your desktop or somewhere easy to access. Have something that you can send to people that they know that it's safe for them to look at. And you want to have create teachable moments in the spot while it's fresh. They can understand what they, they did incorrectly. And again, most of the time I have found that people are willing to do it, to listen to me because I've done all these other steps to make them feel listened and heard and comfortable. But again, I know, and I worked for law firms for a long time. I know that not everyone is going to be receptive to that. So you do your best, but teachable moments on the spot are great ways to help create a culture of security by showing people how to do the right thing. So let's talk about a time that I did a teachable moment. So Mike actually called the SOC and said, uh, I'm having this issue with my mouse that it's jumping all over my screen. And I said, oh, okay, Mike, well, you've reached the security office. It sounds like you might need the help desk. May I transfer you over there? And I gave him the opportunity to give me more information, which he did. He then said, well, I just spoke to the help desk and they said, this is a security issue. And I said, oh, why is that? He said, well, last week I went to a malicious site on my laptop and now my mouse doesn't work. Oh, okay. So that is information I could have used a few minutes ago. I did not say that, but I'm thinking, okay, so now I have more information. So now this is a new game, right? Now we, we may have a security issue. So I do all the, the steps to figure out where he went, what he did, did anything download, and everything I'm finding is coming up clean. His computer's clean. I'm not seeing any downloads. I'm not seeing anything. But I don't want to just abandon him and be like, oh, okay, everything looks good for security. I want to send you back to the help desk. I wanted to see this through. And I don't know why or how, but all of a sudden it came to me and I said, Mike, are you using a wireless mouse? To which he gasped, oh, you can see that through the computer? No, I cannot see that. I said, it's just a hunch here. And he said, yes, I'm using a wireless mouse. I said, okay, let's go with this. When's the last time you changed the battery in that wireless mouse? And there's a pause and he thinks and he goes, never. Okay, let's do this. Go find some fresh batteries, try it out call me back. So I moved on to my next problem. He calls me back 15 minutes later, very apologetic, very sheepishly said, yeah, it was the batteries. It, the mouse is fine. It just needed new batteries. I said, okay, great. Your mouse problem is solved, but I'd like to take a few minutes to go over that email you received, which took you to that malicious website. I want to show you the red flags that you perhaps missed or overlooked. May I have some of your time to go through this now? Because I took the time to solve his problem and didn't make him feel bad about it, he stayed on the phone with me while I was able to walk through and make it a teachable moment. And he learned, learned going forward. And he, he said to me, he said, oh, now some of the stuff up was new to me. Now I know this going forward. I'd made that a teachable moment. And it's because I was listening. I was using these steps. I was listening to what he said, to what he didn't say putting things together and then, you know, showed him this, the, the things that he did that he could improve upon. And then I left him with, I'm going to send you this email with this information. And this was all, all a good thing. Cause otherwise what he would have been bouncing around between departments. And the next time that there really was a serious issue, he may not reach out to anyone because he had a bad treatment before. Let's get to step seven, follow up. So this is the last of the seven steps, and this is kind of what you want it to be. This is things of, think of initiatives to further create a culture of security with your own organizations. Are you short on time? Do you have playbooks written up 
for some of the, the ordinary tasks that you see all the time or the ordinary problems. This not only helps the people working security, but also helps the end user because security then, if there's a playbook and instructions of how to solve some of your most frequently seen issues, you can get back to the end user quicker to solve their problem or get back to the other department quicker to solve the issues that they're having. Have guides that you can either give to departments or individuals or even to the security employees of how to handle responses. You know, what, what language do you have for teachable moments? What materials do you have? You know, come up with other ways to improve your end user interaction and your interdepartment interaction. But most importantly, for follow-up, turn takeaways from your user interaction into improvements. Do you realize that maybe there was a flaw in a system that could be improved upon? Like I mentioned the meeting before with the other department where maybe we weren't really so great to them. I saw that that was a problem, but I turned that into an opportunity to improve a process. So really kind of do these, these you know, post-mortem evaluations of things. Are you identifying issues that you can then turn into gold? Because then that's gonna make things better for everybody. So some other things to follow up, I like to call random acts of security kindness. Lead by example, tell, then show. What do I mean by this? Don't just tell someone, use a password manager, and then walk away thinking that you are the most amazing security professional in the world because you dispensed some fairy dust of knowledge. If you don't show them how to use a password manager, they're not going to use it. If there's another department that's doing something that might be secure, don't just tell them that they're doing it wrong. Show them how to use it correctly. Facilitate security through kindness. And this is perhaps one of my favorite ones that I call the cyber cupcake. This came to me one day in the SOC that I wanted to reward someone for, for doing something good by bringing attention to a problem to us, uh, and also just being re very receptive of how to remediate it. And I couldn't think of anything to do. And at the time I worked for this, you know, multinational global organization, I couldn't send them anything. So I thought, what do people like? People like cupcakes and they can be anything, especially a picture of them can be anything you want. They can be gluten-free, they can be vegan, they can have bacon on them in a photo, whatever you want. So I found a picture of a cupcake and I sent it to them an email and I said, you know, thank you for bringing this to our attention and for the great work for fixing it. Here is a, a cyber cupcake. I called it a cyber cupcake. Sure, I thought that they might roll their eyes and think I was dumb for sending that. The response I got back was so heartwarming. It was, you made my day. And I kept doing that. So whether it was through a messenger with an emoji or this just JPEG I had saved on my desktop, I send out cupcakes to reward positive behavior from a department or an end user. And I've, I've done this, you know, I, I do this as often as I can, not to the point that it, it ruins the surprise of a cupcake, but, you know, if I see something that somebody really went out of their way to do to work with security, Reward that positive behavior. Now, if you work in a small enough organization where you can give actual cupcakes, oh, you're going to be a big hero. But for those of us who are more distanced, and everybody's kind of distanced these days, right? You know, a cupcake emoji goes a long way from making someone feel good about what they, they did to help with security. Another way is to do outreach. Everybody loves snacks, right? So this is an actual photo of a king cake from a Mardi Gras uh, party that that my department had, we had an extra king cake. So I had the thought, oh, our security office hours are tomorrow. I'm going to bring this king cake to the office hours. And when I tell people that we're open for office hours, uh, I'm going to tell people that we have cake and then they can have cake, but they also have to talk to us about security. So sure enough, we had an amazing turnout and we did have some people who wanted to steal cake and run away, but there was actually one person I, I kept him in the doorway for five minutes while I talked to him about security. And in the end was actually able to educate him about something he didn't know about while he stood there nibbling on his piece of cake. And it was just, it was a great session. You know, snacks bring people out in the office. Now, again, I know things are more difficult because we're all distance, but 
Someday in the future, we will most likely be on site again, or you can send people things. You can send people, say, a Starbucks uh, gift card through email and as, you know, a snack for them. You know, think of it as a return on investment. You know, you want to, to entice people to listen to you, and snacks kind of help facilitate that. I also want to share something that I, we did for a long time in the last library I worked at. Now, again, this might not be possible for all of you, but I just want to share this as an example of something we did. So every Christmas time, everyone on the library staff would bake home goods, cookies, cakes, cupcakes, you know, candies, you name it. We'd all bring them in on this appointed day and we'd create these big trays full of, of snacks and wrap them up real nice. And then we'd walk through the firm and we'd give them to the help desk, to the mail room, to accounting, to the receptionists, to thank them for working with us throughout the year. And this was relationship building. And, you know, some, some people have heard me tell this story and say, oh, well, you just bribed them. No, we didn't bribe them to do anything. It was not in exchange for anything. It was out of the goodness of our hearts. But that return on investment goes a long way because six months later when it's 4.59 on a Friday of a holiday weekend and you need a check cut and someone from accounting will stay late to help you, a cookie tray goes a long way to build that, that interdepartment relationships that help you. So we all need each other to succeed. So do things like outreach and nice things like that to have a return on investment of kindness and it's relationship building. I wanna bring up the lunch and learn. This is not a new concept. And a lot of people think of lunch and learns as dealing with end users. I wanna throw the idea out there of doing a lunch and learn with other departments. And again, I've said this a couple times, I know from experience that other tech departments see security as a mystery. And so why not come together for a meal? Have them spend 15 minutes talking about what they're working on. Spend 15 minutes talking about what security is working on. Figure out how you can work on things together. Outreach to your other departments within the organization can again help build a culture of security. Now, I wanna share this with you, but I wanna be careful about the wording because I am in no way trying to say that education is not important. Uh, this is an actual article that appeared in the Washington Post on April 4th, 2018. It's all about a study from the Journal of Psychological Science in the Public Interest. And one of the scientists said, uh, well, sorry, the headline is, people can't be educated into vaccinations, but behavioral nudges help. Now, when I read this in my mind, I thought, oh, if you replace that with information security, that reflects a lot of what we're dealing with. So then it reads, people can't be educated into information security, but behavioral nudges help. Now, again, please read the full article and the study because I am absolutely not saying that education doesn't help. Education does very much help. The point of me sharing this is, is that other disciplines deal with very similar problems as we do, and they all have ways different than, than we've ever seen of dealing with them. So there was a health official who was quoted in this, this journal article who said, when it comes to vaccines, I think we have this optimistic belief that just by telling people facts, you can change their behavior. Again, replace that with information security. When it comes to information security, I think we have this optimistic belief that just by telling people facts, you can change their behavior. Does that sound familiar? Again, I want you to tell then show. You know, just don't spout statistics, you know, oh, you know, 85% of companies who, you know, were compromised did it through email. Okay, that's a nice statistic, but that doesn't really help the end user. It doesn't help another department. So what I really want you to do is to keep an open mind. And when you're looking at your follow-up step, Look to other industries, other disciplines. How do other people solve the similar problems that we have in security? Oh. My computer just slowed down for a second here, sorry. What is happening? Sorry, my computer is, okay. 
Yes. Oh, man. Okay, automation, sorry about that. Um, computers, right? Um, automation, uh, has everything been automated that it can be while still maintaining approachability? Again, I talked about having canned responses, you know, or playbooks set up ahead of time. But remember, there are so many people out there who think that there's nothing but, you know, bleep blorp, blinky boxes uh, behind the scenes. Make them know that there's there's humans there, but for our sake, for workload, Automate what you can, but without losing that touch. So to, to wrap up here, we have some, we have our seven steps of approachability, interest, listening, interviewing, searching, answering, and follow-up. These are all seven solid steps that we can apply to security and you can get a lot done. Thank you, Tracy. Oh, I'm, I'm not done yet. I'm so sorry. That's okay. So um, uh, just a few more minutes, everyone. Sorry. Uh, so I've thrown a lot at you today. Uh, so I'm going to give you some strategies for success or also why you should care about creating a culture of security. One is the sugar bowl principle. I know that we all have exp expensive blinky boxes to help with network security. But remember, security at its core is human-centric. So make your security team compatible with the humans that you're protecting. The humans are your front line, your inf infantry. Make sure they know how to report back to you. The sugar bowl principle is if you have a bowl of sugar and you drop it on the floor, the bowl shatters and the sugar goes everywhere. You have two choices. You can either clean it up right away to make it look to the point that nothing ever happened, or you let it sit and fester. Maybe you cut your foot on a shard of the, of the glass and the sugar gets under the tiles and now you have ants and you have a bigger problem. I'd rather be approachable and have a user or a department contact me at a minute before lunch about a problem than a minute before quitting time on a holiday weekend and then I have to spend all night and all weekend solving something. If you make yourself approachable, you'll learn about problems sooner and that's best for everyone. Another reason why I should care about security as a, as a culture is because security is a cost center, also known as overhead, cost center versus profit center. Why may not make security the model for all the other departments? When I was a librarian at my last firm, the library consistently scored the highest of all the firm's departments when it came to internal customer satisfaction and performance and was held up as an example within the firm. Now, I'm not saying that I specifically was the reason for that, I'm just saying that I know what it's like to work on a high-performing team and what success looks like. Now, I want to give you a coping tip real quick. Uh, dealing with a lot of, of end users and other departments can be very stressful, and you want to let that stress go. What I dealt with a lot in the SOC was a lot of coworkers saying things like stupid users, stupid engineers, stupid developers, you know, stupid this, stupid that. Everybody was stupid. I chose to take a little bit more positive route. I channeled my inner Southern US woman. And if somebody did something that was, you know, not great security wise, I'd just take a deep breath and just say, bless their heart for trying. Now, those of you who are familiar with this expression know, this isn't actually a nice thing to say, but it's a not nice thing to say said in a nice way. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes that's all you can do. You need to get your stress out, but I prefer to do it in a more positive way just deep breath, click my tongue, you know, they are just, bust their heart for trying, they are just doing the best with, with what the Lord gave them, you know what, and just exhale and go about your day, sometimes that's the best you can do. And then, uh, just want to kind of leave you with some thoughts here. A lot of this uh, human interaction may be out of the comfort zone for a lot of people here. But you know what the great thing is? It's just a skill, like anything else. You didn't come out of the womb knowing how to code. You had to learn how to code, and you had to perfect it, and you had to hone it. These people skills are just that. They're just skills that you learn and you hone. It might come easier to some people than others. But the late tennis great Arthur Ashe famously said, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. 
And our parting thought for today, it's from the late author, Lebanese author, Khalil Gibran. Tenderness and kindness are not signs of weakness and despair, but manifestations of strength and resolution. Now go out there, be strong, use empathy as a service to create a culture of security. I believe in you. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. That was amazing. I apologize for interrupting you. The audience was very emphatic that they wanted more Tracy. Um, <laughs> that happens. I, and I apologize for the uh, computer issue, but you know, computers. Um, just a hashtag shameless plug. The first one's my OSINT blog. The next is my Nuzzle newsletter. Uh, and then it's my, my Twitter. But uh, yeah, I'm happy to take, to take questions. So I actually have a great question from Emily Cole. Um, okay. They say, I'd love to hear Tracy talk about ways to influence people to build more security into their products, which I'm assuming that means, you know, working with colleagues who may be in product development and other technologists who are not in security at your organization. Uh, sure. Do you have another hour <laughs> to spare <laughs> about that? Um as quickly as I can, Emily, um, you know, it's again, using these techniques of, you know, meeting with them, understand, try to understand what their challenges are. Why do they think security is a blocker for them? I would kind of start with, I would start with a reference interview, you know, show them how something is insecure and ask them, you know, like this, this could be more secure this way. You know, have you thought of that? There's a chance they haven't even thought of it. But I would try to find out their motivations, find out what they think, why they think security is a blocker to them. Um, you may not get great answers. They may just shrug their shoulders. And I, I went to a developer's con conference once and nobody cared about security <laughs> and they told me as such. Um, but on the one hand, I took away from it, okay, well, this is the attitude I'm dealing with. So now I'll prepare that way. So. I would try to discuss with people why they think security is a blocker and kind of go from there. And then again, tell then show, tell them how it can be better and then show them. So I hope that helps. Wonderful. Um, and Sarah Cl uh, Clark asks how you've dealt with raising executive level awareness of basics, uh, which can be a managing up challenge. Sure. Um, now, a lot of times that's not personally uh, my responsibility, but I've worked as part of a team for it. Um, you know, you need to make it personalized to them. So, you know, they may say, you know, well, I'm, you know, at my old job in the SOC, you know, we'd have people say, well, I'm not on social media. And I would say, well, is your, is your spouse or your kids? <laughs> you know, you come at it from different ways. And usually that's the buy-on of, oh, Okay, because a lot of times they, they don't think outside of their own scope of things. Um, if it helps, depending on who you're talking to, talk about the cost benefits, the savings. People love, executives love savings, right? <laughs> so uh, figure out ways to, to demonstrate security as a cost-saving measure, and I guarantee you a lot of executives will, will respond to that. Uh, so again, you, there's a, a great... Uh, some great articles out there about brain types. Uh, you you kind of figure out the brain type of the person you're speaking to, and you address those you know Maslow hierarchy of needs with them. You figure out what they hold most dear and address that. If they're if they're cost very cost conscious, cons, cost centric, then address costs of security. How it's a good thing. Like well, we could spend X amount and protect you now, or we could spend X millions amounts later to recover you know, from a, a breach and, and things like that. So if you kind of put it that way, then, then a lot of people understand. I hope that helps. I think that's, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, Cassandra Brunetto um, is curious what your most challenging experience was with a customer or client and how you navigated that. Sure. Uh, it's not actually a security example, Cassandra, but I would like to share one with you. When I was at the law firm library, I had this one, uh, you know, when this one attorney, he was very old. Um, he, he was a, 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 let me, let me phrase this delicately. Uh, he was close to retirement. Um, 
and he was just very persnickety and he would fight with me tooth and nail all the time. He constantly wanted me to purchase books for him and it got very contentious and it got very stressful. And one day my boss said, you two are going to go to lunch and hash this out because I'm tired of hearing about it <laughs> from both of you. So we went to lunch and he explained to me that, you know, he was concerned that he was getting pushed out of the firm because he was close to retirement. And he wanted all these books because he wanted to, to show that he could take on different types of cases. I said, okay, I understand that, but I only have a certain budget that I can buy books <laughs> with. I can't just buy every book for your whim. So we, we hashed all this out and we came to an understanding. And I said, I understood what he, where he was coming from. And I made a deal with him. I said, when you sign a client, you know, actually sign the paper, sign a client to a different area of law for which you do not have a book then I will buy it for you. And he was happy with that. But until that, we were really butting heads a lot and it was a very stressful situation. So uh, yeah, it took being forced together over lunch uh, to hash out, to understand his point of view. And then I was able to make you know, a reasonable accommodation for that. And from then on, like I was his librarian, like he only wanted to talk to me. And, uh, you know, but smooth sailing, then I was able to really then call the shots of, you know, and say things to like, no, you already own that book. Oh, right, right, okay. Uh, so I hope that helps, but uh, yeah, it's, sometimes it's just kind of understanding someone's situation. They, they might bark a lot, but if you, uh, you know, get down, sit down, and under, really understand what their problems are, what their motivations are, then you can work with that. Fantastic. Um, I believe that we are coming up close to nine, um, Pacific. So um, I'll let you close. Um, the audience is typing things like wild applause. It was oh, fantastic. sorry. Yeah, Welcome. let me get to that page there. Um, I am terribly sorry that I had that little bit of a computer issue, everyone. So I apologize for that, but thank you. Thank you so much. But yeah, I, I apologize for the little glitch that we had. But what can you do? Computers. <laughs> But thank you so much for joining me today. I really hope this was helpful. I hope you like this. Um, I'm passionate about this. Uh, and I just, I want all of us to do better. I, I just want everyone to feel the way I do about, about security. And, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, it can be, it can be a very positive experience. So thank you all for spending time with me today. I really appreciate it.